I have a fairly long uh, presentation. I really, though, want to take you all on a trip down memory lane. Uh, when Travis Lupick from the uh, Georgia Strait asked me, why was I doing this? Indeed, part of it is because so many of the things we're talking about in the housing scene today are things that uh, some of us who are older have witnessed in the past. And for others of you, this may be indeed uh, a story about events that you never even knew happened. So with that, I'm going to get started, and, uh, and I hope that uh, you will find this uh, worthwhile. Um, the first thing, though, is this is a bit of a personal journey, and so I do want to at least try and help you appreciate what I was doing in Vancouver at the time when many of these articles were, were published and these stories uh, happened. So I originally came here in 1974 not to be a real estate developer, but because I was an official with CMHC, the Federal Housing Agency, <coughs> excuse me, where I was the program manager of uh, social housing. I was the assistant architect planner and eventually got involved with the uh, False Creek project, which I will show you. Um, once False Creek got underway, I was banished to Ontario, where I was involved in a similar development called the St. Lawrence Project and Harbourfront in Toronto. Eventually left CMAC after 10 years and came back in 81 to join a private development company known NARAD, which in its day was a very substantial, uh, active development and construction company. Uh, by 83, uh, my colleagues and I had put NARAD into receivership, and, uh, but it was a great opportunity for me to set up my own, uh, my own small company. And uh, one day I learned that I had been elected to the board of the Urban Development Institute. And when I asked my boss, how did that happen? He said, because we paid them the outstanding dues. <laughs> I, uh, I was flattered to, to become elected the president of the Urban Development Institute, which caused great trepidation amongst most of the legitimate members. And in 88, I actually became president of UDI Canada, and you'll see far too many pictures and stories tonight about that tumultuous period in, in development history and the financial history. In 99, though, I uh, left my own company to go up to Simon Fraser University, and I'm not going to tell you too much about that tonight. Um, <clears throat> in 2007, my wife and I took a year and went around the world, and then I started working again in 2008. I can't remember exactly what adjective Gordon Price used to describe my political career, but it was about as successful as Hector Brebner's, I would say. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, almost, uh, I, uh, my daughter who's here tonight said I was the first loser. <laughs> um, I've continued to work in planning and consulting and development and, uh, and quite proudly announced that four, it was four years ago this week that I started writing for The Courier. So this is what we're going to chat about tonight. Some of the uh, major projects, uh, this whole question of what constitutes the affordability crisis and when did it start. I want to talk about foreign buyers, which uh, I don't think a day goes by when we don't talk about that, but also the local first policy. Uh, we're going to talk about taxes. We're going to talk about condo pre-sales. We have to talk about nimbyism, disdain for developers. The two often go together. But I do want to finish off with some solutions, because otherwise this would all be simply a story with no real value. Uh, this is a map of Vancouver. Uh, this presentation will obviously focus a lot on Vancouver because it is the center of the universe, but we will be ex expanding beyond the boundaries. But the major projects in Vancouver have certainly played a significant role and in reviewing this map race specs, when I noticed that Stanley Park is identified as one of the potential major project sites. So that's something I'm looking forward to. But in the early 60s, 70s, all of the discussion was about False Creek. The South Shore, which the city had assembled, moving out all of the old industrial uses, and the North Shore, which was owned by Marathon Realty. 
with a, the uh, real estate arm of the CPR where Gordon C Campbell was working. And uh, it's quite interesting to go back and look at the debate that took place because today, of course, most of us, I think, would generally think of the False Creek South Shore as a very successful development. But in fact, there was by no means unanimity that it should be developed for housing. Um, even though the site was cleared, even the late Art Cowie uh, argued that it should be all park, that this wasn't really an appropriate place for housing. And he wasn't alone. Indeed, many people in the community felt it was a waste to be putting housing in this location when there was such a need for park space. It's interesting, some of you may know, the Board of Trade made announcement today about Vancouver's uh, station in, by international ranking. The Board of Trade came out in opposition of housing along the south shore of False Creek. And Harry Rankin, and uh, though hopefully many of you got a chance to see the wonderful documentary about Harry that was playing in town this week. Harry was not opposed to housing, he just wanted to make sure that low-income people would find a place there as well, not just the rich. One thing that I found amusing, and Ray Spaxman may remember this, is one of his own planning staff went public suggesting that it was a completely wrong to be thinking about taking this site with its pollution and the noise and the soil conditions and the traffic problems and so forth to even consider putting a housing development. And I suspect he didn't have to come back to work after this article appeared in the <laughs> Vancouver province. And indeed, Ray was instrumental in making, and uh, for those of you who don't know Ray Spaxman, he, lo he looks almost the same today as he did here. A little softer and a little gentler, though, I think his wife would agree. Ray was very involved in looking at the plans that were prepared by three different teams. He was concerned about the livability and the innovation, and I think it's fair to say that the success that the community has enjoyed indeed is very much the result of his input. And it was interesting that by 1977, as the first homes were getting occupied, this story in the Montreal Gazette appeared, talking about bringing the rich and the humble together. And indeed, the reason that was happening was because of a very deliberate policy that the community be one-third low income, one-third mid-income, and one-third higher income. And indeed, the challenge for Doug Sutcliffe, the project manager, was to encourage some of the higher income people to want to move in. And I will tell you in a minute how that happened. But here are some old photos that I found from a publication of False Creek under construction. And indeed, uh, ultimately, as you may know, it came into this very creative community with some very innovative planning concepts. Uh, they often were referred to as donuts, where the pr sort of private space was in the middle, the semi-private space was outside. Many of these roads were pedestrian only. It truly was a sustainable community, although we never used that word sustainable in the 70s. Uh, I discovered yesterday this tweet by David Holchansky, whose name many of you may know, pointing out, how this remarkable community with a significant component of affordable social housing co-ops was created. And indeed, I think many people wonder, why can't we do this today? Well, one of the reasons is because there was a generous array of government housing programs at the federal, provincial, and municipal level, but certainly the federal and provincial level. And that's what helped make it work. In order to attract higher income people, one of the programs said that you could not have a mortgage for more than $30,000. And the reason for that was because Doug Sutcliffe wanted to encourage people from Carisdale and Dunbar and Shaughnessy who had homes to sell their homes and move into this community. And they weren't coming. And indeed, the project had a pretty negative public image for quite a while until one day the then mayor, Art Phillips, announced that he and his very beautiful wife, an accomplished wife, Carol Taylor, would be moving into the community. 
And I really believe that changed the whole public perception of the place. And years later, I worked on the Bayshore Project, and I'll be showing you that. And I was telling this story to my client, and I said, what we have to do is find someone like Art Phillips and Carol Taylor to move into Bayshore. And when we get to that Bayshore project, I'll tell you who we got. <laughs> Not everything at Falls Creek was a success. I think the idea was it would be a walkable community, but Leg and Boot Square, perhaps because of the solar orientation and its design, never became the little village center and town square that I think many of us hoped it would be. But I, I, I take some pride in the fact that uh, I had the opportunity, because of my association with NARAD and after its receivership, to be party to the development of the last phase, the last development, the lagoons, which many of you may know as the development at the entrance to Granville Island. Uh, before we leave Falls Creek, though, I'd like to throw a couple of suggestions out. The first is, there used to be a railway going along there, and to protect the residents, we built a large berm. Well, of course, that railway is gone, and as far as I'm concerned, that berm represents a wonderful development opportunity. Because as many of you may know, the leases on the South Shore of Falls Creek are coming up, and the city is now developing a strategy for the refurbishment or regeneration of that community. The other thing is a lot of the people who moved in 35 years ago, their families have moved out, but they're still there, occupying large units. And I once mentioned this to Councillor uh, Jeff Meggs, who said, look, Geller, it's the sort of thing I'd expect from you to want to kick these people out. Can't we just wait until they die? <laughs> There's another story about the South Shore of Falls Creek. Art Phillips wanted it to be a transit-oriented community. There was very limited parking. He went to BC Transit and said he wanted a bus line in place the day the first residents moved in, and they said, of course, don't be silly. We can't afford it. And Phillips asked them, how much would it cost? And they came up with a number. Phillips then came to us at CMHC in the province and said, we would like to levy an individual charge against every rental, co-op, and market housing unit to subsidize the transit so that that bus is in place the day the first residents move in. And I've often thought, that's an idea we should be applying today. I recently worked on a new subdivision in Maple Ridge. There's no public transit anywhere near this development because they don't want to finance it and lose the money. And again, I think we should be rethinking that, and we'll talk about that later. 1983, we also saw the redevelopment proposals for the North Shore Falls Creek. Marathon Realty sold the land to the province, and the province started to develop it. And in reading the, some of these clippings, I came across this proposal, uh, which Alvin Nayrod, the founder of the company that I worked for, he had begun, become the chairman of BC Place. And what an interesting idea. It's an idea that is actually applicable today in Toronto under a program called Options for Homes, where there's a silent second mortgage registered against properties in order to help people get in with a lower down payment and a lower monthly payment. And so this idea of relating the housing costs to what someone can afford, recognizing there may be a gap that's secured by a mortgage. It's an idea I think could have application elsewhere. The other thing is BC Place started to uh, make a number of sites available. Uh, I worked on a, a couple of them. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, Admiralty and the Discovery were developed around that time, and the Pagebrook developments, those red brick developments. But of course, while this was all happening, the event that changed our city forever was being planned. And of course, I refer to Expo 86. And uh, I still have my copy of McLean's magazine in which Mike Harcourt uh, argued that Vancouver should not hold this World Fair. And although it was a wonderful event for those of us who went, I suspect there are some people who today would say maybe we shouldn't have held it either 
because so many people feel we invited the world, they came, and it's changed the complexion of our city forever. But following expert, this man was, was pontificating the other day about the fact that the province and the city decided that the North Shore of Falls Creek would be developed into a very livable community. There was a very fierce international competition held. Most of us were absolutely convinced that Jack Poole and some of his friends were going to buy, be the successful bidders. And lo and behold, I was asked to help a group from Toronto headed by Bramley Developments. But my heart wasn't in it because I said, we're all so parochial here, we won't even pick anyone outside of British Columbia. Boy, was I wrong. Because, of course, Li Keqing was the successful bidder. We now know he didn't pay $320 million. Indeed, I think he paid $50 million up front and a little bit more in the Never Never plan. And we all paid to remediate that site. But the fact is, within five years, the development was progressing in accordance with an overall plan that had been developed closely with the city with a very high level of public amenities, the public walkways, parks, childcare facilities, schools, and so forth. And ultimately, I think, while we can criticize many aspects of the development, especially the fact that it certainly wasn't affordable to a lot of people, it really has ultimately happened. And I suspect that had it been left to Jack Poole or any of the other local builders, it wouldn't have happened. Jack Poole's company went broke eventually. Uh, Bramley eventually went broke. But Li Keqing has continued to do very, very well. So although much of the site has been developed, I think it is important to note that a number of the social housing sites that were identified early on remain vacant. They lie fallow. And I think one of the things that we all collectively need to talk about is how do we get those sites developed in the absence of the deep government subsidies? And while the False Creek development was progressing, planning was underway for the North Shore of Co the Coal Harbor waterfront. And two major developments, the Marathon lands, Marathon held on to their property there, and another development with which I was involved, the Western Bayshore Hotel. And again, you know, just looking at some of these pictures, it's very hard to remember what a barren wasteland with one or two restaurants that whole area was. And of course, you take a look at it today, and I think it really is quite magnificent. And I don't know how many of you do do that walk from, say, Stanley Park, or Denman Street, along that waterfront, looking at the magnificent parks and those very expensive condominiums. But interspersed in there, there is the uh, Coal Harbor Co-op and a number of other uh, lower income rental housing projects. And it is, I think, a very successful community. However, it is missing a couple of things. It is, if you look at that arrow, it's missing a school. That's the school site. And you know, we keep talking about increasing family housing in the city. We can only do that if we can get the school board to build schools for the time the children are going to move in. There's also a social housing site integrated with that. So hopefully this talk will spear on the, 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 the development of that school, and, and because I think it's completely wrong that that site remains undeveloped. So here's the Bayshore next to Stanley Park. Those of you who are really old, will remember when that Devonian Harbor Park was known as Four Seasons Park, because Four Seasons Hotel was going to build a hotel there, much to the chagrin of all the hippies who took it over. But the Bayshore was a wonderful opportunity. And uh, I spent 10 years uh, from day one working on the overall plan with uh, Norm Hodson and Arthur Erickson um, and some very, very talented landscape architects at Jane Durante and uh, Don Vaughn's firm. And one of the things that we wanted to do was depart from what had become the norm in Vancouver, which was 600 square foot one bedrooms and 800 square foot two bedrooms. 
People really were nervous whether or not you could sell larger condominiums. But I'd lived in Toronto, I'd lived in England, and I believed that you could have much larger condominiums and indeed create a very attractive neighborhood. So our average unit size at Bayshore was 1,200 square feet. And even by most development standards today, that's a very large, a very large uh, size. I remember when this drawing was done and I was walking down from the artist uh, rendering in Gastown and I ran into Ray Spaxman and I thought, my God, do I dare show him this drawing? Because believe it or not, although today by our, my standards, it seems like a relatively low density scheme at about 2.75 FSR, James Chang is shaking his head. At that time, we thought, my God, are we ever going, is this too much? My only regret is that little building at the corner of Denman and Georgia, like Arthur Erickson's tower on the False Creek North Shore, should have been a lot taller. But a key issue, and it's a debate we're having now, was how to integrate the social housing with the market housing, because the requirement was that 20% of the units be social housing. But having come from CMHC, I knew that the deep subsidies weren't going to be there, and so I wanted to try and come up with an alternative. Either give some money, and I developed a partnership with Jim Green, uh, who at the time was talking about the redevelopment of the Woodward's property. And uh, alternative, I said, we would just build a reduced number of social housing units and then hand them over to the city. I got into a lot of trouble because I also had concerns, and I still stand by it, that if that integrated mixed communities are very, very good idea. But sometimes if there's too much disparity, then it's not necessarily a good idea. Indeed, now many people in the downtown east side are arguing there shouldn't be condos there for exactly the same reason. But we did develop a non-market component for seniors known as the Performing Arts Lodge. And it troubles me that this model has not been emulated. Basically, it's not a condo. It's not even a straight rental building. It's a rental building, but a number of the units were purchased by individuals, generally media personalities, Dave Abbott, people like that, who made an upfront payment. And when they decided to leave, they got that payment back, but no appreciation. But the nonprofit could then use that money as its equity to go to the bank. And that's how this project came to be. The other thing, next door is this valiant, rather handsome building, which is a rental tower. And indeed, one of the conditions was to integrate rental and ownership. And it is interesting how attitudes towards rental housing have changed. In many areas, people did tend to think of rental housing as second-class housing for second-class people. Trust me, there's nothing second class about this building, nor any of the people who are living in it, or for that matter, most of the renters in Vancouver these days, because as I've often put out on Twitter, sometimes the only difference between someone who rents and someone who owns is whether or not they have a mother or father or an uncle who will give them the $200,000 down payment they need. While we look at these major projects in Vancouver, I was also working a few years earlier on a waterfront redevelopment in Richmond. Again, those of you who know Steveston know it as a pretty vibrant, lively community. But for many years, these lands were owned by BC Packers, the fish company. And uh, it is interesting, I think, to look at the names of the people who are writing about it. Bob Bransford, as you know, has become a very accomplished developer and commentator. And Ted Townsend, who wrote for the Richmond Review, is now a senior official at the city of Richmond. But what was interesting, again, old age uh, helps you understand this. I initially saw this as a more compact, multifamily community with a limited amount of single family homes up against the existing single-family homes. We rezoned it on that basis. But within a year after rezoning it, the developers who were going to take it on said there isn't a market for all these 
condominium apartments and townhouses. They rezoned it to single family housing, and then later on it got zoned back into multifamily. I can tell you I worked on another site in Richmond, an industrial site that I rezoned from industrial to residential, only a few years later to come back and argue to the same council why it should be rezoned from residential back to industrial, because the land values had changed that much. So let's talk about land values and housing affordability. Now, I should, I should really go back and let you look at that, because in the middle, that's me in the big house, the baby boomer. And some of those of you who are Generation X, you get that little cottage. And then Generation Y, you get, you get the tent. <laughs> Hopefully, we can do something about that. A very interesting book was written in 1975 by Donald Gutstein, who was an architect and a housing activist who was extremely distraught at what he saw happening, particularly in Kitsilano and other parts of the city. And in his book, he tried to analyze who was responsible for the housing crisis of the day. Because yes, in the mid-70s, it was felt that there was a real housing crisis then. And he looked at the various levels of government. Even though in those days, CMHC had generous housing programs, the province had programs, GVRD had its own housing corporation, but ultimately, he, he laid the blame at the developers, the greedy developers. And if you find a copy of the book, he can actually give you a tour of the homes of all the developers so that you could see how much, they, how much money they were making at the expense of all the citizens. But it's interesting that three or four years later, the market started to change. And all of a sudden, housing was booming again. And uh, there seemed to be much more vitality in the market. And this brings me to, I think, a very important point. And that is, Vancouver's housing market, well, overall, overall, as you can see in that chart on the left, prices go up. Over time, prices generally go up. But there are cyclical aspects to the market. And indeed, we've gone through a few of them. I thought the best analogy was to be on a roller coaster ride. As I mentioned, I came back here in 1981. In 1980, just before I came back, the average house price was around 86,000. And as you can see, one year later, it had gone from 86,000 to 177,000. We bought in February 1982, and when my wife saw this uh, slide, she said, I guess we bought near the right time. Well, we didn't, because two years later after we bought, our house was worth less than we paid for it. But then again, five years later, prices had come back up. And I think it is important to recognize that prices don't always just go up, and indeed, uh, Frank O'Brien wrote a piece today, which uh, if enough people read it, it will contribute to a further collapse of the housing market, because it actually is starting to happen right now. The other factor was interest rates. When I was growing up, my parents had a 7% NHA mortgage. And when we bought our home, the interest rates were hovering in double digits, close to uh, 18 19%. We were so excited that the person who sold our house took a mortgage back at 14%. We thought we'd died and gone to heaven. But then I found this chart, which I found interesting, because if you took a certain point in time, in 1981, when those prices were peaking and the interest rates were peaking, if you then looked at what was the monthly payments on a home then, as you can see, it was significantly higher than they, what they were a couple of years ago when prices had risen considerably, but interest rates had dropped a lot. Now, I want to stress, in no way am I suggesting that what the situation we have today is not severe. It is. It is a crisis. But it is interesting to look at the impact of both prices and interest rates together. Now, I tweeted this out, and I had a barrage of people criticizing me. But one person did share with me this chart, and I think this is relevant because what it sadly shows is just how long it does take today for sort of the average person to arrange the average down payment if they don't have a rich uncle or parent 
to help them with it. And sadly it is, according to Generation Squeeze, 27 years. If you just simply try and apply the little bit extra, you can save. So exactly 30 years ago, this headline appeared in the newspaper. I had become president of UDI, I'd given a talk in Toronto, and there I saw a real housing crisis. I came back and I was concerned that as long as we were not opening up more single family land for multifamily and doing other things to increase the supply of housing, a crisis would have developed in Vancouver. <clears throat> However, Helmut Pastrick, who I still play golf with, who's a very smart guy, he said that what was happening in Toronto would never happen in Vancouver. Which is why I don't listen to everything the economists say to me. Nor the politicians, because indeed, at this point in time, uh, Premier van der Zalm was starting to look at the situation. The budget was about, the throne speech was about to come by. There was a by-election in Point Grey, and uh, all of a sudden, van der Zalm started to pay a little bit of attention to all of the renters who were concerned with what was beginning to happen in, in, in the city. And uh, eventually, the throne speech came. We got this budget. Mel Cuvelier, a name that I'd forgotten about. Many of you have never heard of it. But it was so interesting, because here were the Socreds, those ardent right-wingers, bringing forth a budget full of rent supplements and rental programs. And when I was asked to comment it, as I said, it sounded a lot like an NDP budget to me. Mike Harcourt said the same thing. And at the same time, we had Ottawa also, a new minister of housing, Alan Redway, who actually was interested in housing, which was almost a first since Barney Danson, who'd been interested. And he was starting to think about different ways that the federal government could help. But it's so interesting to look at the provincial programs of the day and the federal programs of the day. It's almost identical to the conversation that's taking place right now. And I think that headline applies today. Yes, there's no doubt a lot of people are paying attention to the problems we've got, but there is no quick housing fix. It has taken at least three or four decades to get into the situation we're in now. And I sadly have to say, I think it's going to take decades before we get back to the point where we constantly don't have everybody uh, obsessed with the fact that they can't afford to live in this city and work in this city and worrying about it. One of the interesting interests, but we do make progress. One of the issues at that time was rental housing. A lot of people lived in basement suites, but they were illegal. And when anyone suggested legalizing basement suites, it was as outrageous as suggesting that we legalize marijuana. Well, we'll soon have both legalized basement suites and legalized marijuana. And not only are basement suites legal, we even have the municipalities now encouraging builders to create new homes with basement suites. But the big issue of the day was whether to bring in rent controls or perhaps some form of rent review. And many question, is there really a difference? Uh, but today we effectively have rent controls. And uh, I think many people would be concerned, even more concerned, if we didn't have them. The one thing that I think the provincial government is going to do is put in place more controls but what we have to recognize is that the average age of the rental buildings in Metro Vancouver is now 62 years old, 62. And a lot of those buildings are not being looked after, and we need to think about how we can replace them. What I, these next slides will show you is that while today we tend to think that if you build a condo, you can sell it over the weekend, at, that, at this time, again, 20 odd years ago, people were concerned whether they could sell their condos. Uh, as this headline suggested, the market for those higher end condos that people were starting to build was really quite limited. And therefore, we were starting to look at creating more smaller units again, both smaller houses, although we've never really been able to tackle that one because of the way we, uh, we, our municipal taxation system works.
But Frank Slowinski, uh, the market analyst of the day, every year used to put out this little traffic light of which markets were good markets and which markets were bad markets. And if you can't see that, but the bad markets were downtown Vancouver, Burnaby, New Westminster, North Surrey. Well, just go to Burnaby and downtown. <laughs> I mean, I think for those of you who don't leave Vancouver, just go to Burnaby. It is unbelievable what's happening there today. But at this point in time, there was a real concern. And one of the reasons why there was concern it was because it was getting more and more difficult to get approvals to build. And this brings me to this topic of nimbyism. And it's not a nice word, I know. But a very strong anti-development feeling was growing throughout the beginning in the 70s and certainly through the 80s. And uh, I unfortunately got to experience it firsthand when I was asked by then Director of Planning of Delta, Art Cowie, to do the plan for the infamous Spedifor lands, 753 acres. And I came up with a team of what I thought was a great plan with a resort-oriented community where the people wouldn't be driving into Vancouver every day with water and a nine-hole golf course and low density. And uh, in the beginning, there was quite a bit of support for it. But over the course of a year and a half, that support dissipated to the point that the Federal Minister of the Environment announced a moratorium so they could study whether the residents were right, whether it was really an international flight path. And that was the first and last time that I organized a press conference using a bale of hay for the microphones. <laughs> Shortly after this, after 26 nights of public hearing, 26 independent nights of public hearing, this was the headline in the province newspaper. The irony was that we actually withdrew the application after the 26th night, but the council wanted to vote on the proposal anyway. <laughs> I had another similar experience. My friend Morris Wask owned Langara Gardens, and he wanted a penthouse. And in order to have a penthouse, he had to have people living under him. So we went, and we got approval for a fourth tower at Langara Gardens. And uh, afterwards, we were standing up there, and he said, Michael, can you get me approval for another one? And I went and saw the planning department, and they said, look, you were here two years ago. You're here now. Why don't we do a comprehensive plan, which we did, working with Trish French and a number of other planners, and we concluded that you could have about three towers bringing the FSR up to 1.15 for this site. It can be in 57th, and this is what was happening. The neighbors were organizing. Indeed, they were organizing in part because, and I hesitate to include this slide, but I have to, one of the planning department's senior planners was concerned about the development because it was going to block his view as well. But at any rate, one morning I was coming out of the shower and my wife phoned, called me and said, the mayor's executive assistant is on the phone and she just wanted to give me a heads up that council was not even going to refer the proposal to public hearing. This was for 350 rental units with no government subsidies. And uh, it became somewhat controversial. People took great delight in suggesting all the reasons why I had messed up. I'd brought a planner to the meeting, and someone wrote a letter saying it was totally inappropriate. It made people think it had already been approved. Anyway, we learned a lot about how to engage the community. But the interesting thing is afterwards, Grant Murray, who some of you may know his name, he's now with Concord Pacific, he made an observation, which I never even realized until I reread this clipping, but he was absolutely right. At the same time, the city was encouraging something called the VLC, the Vancouver Land Corporation, headed by Jack Poole, to build rental housing on city-owned sites. And the suggestion was, maybe it didn't look so good to have this private developer wanting to build. Anyway, 
I couldn't really do very much. The only thing was try and get my revenge for those residents by sitting in the dentist chair one day, hearing the song Santa Claus is Coming to Town. And when I thought of the residents of the Langara Oak Ridge neighborhood, I thought they wouldn't even allow Santa Claus to come to town. <laughs> but I do have to share this with you. This is the latest plan for Langara Gardens. And you can barely see those high-rise towers that, that we were keeping. And uh, indeed, times have changed. But it is important, I think, to recognize this. I mean, this is in a couple of years. But the fact is that anti-development movement was significant. And as a result, the councils in Tawasin, even though they voted against the Spetafor lands, they were thrown out. The council in Delta, the council in Richmond, it was thrown out. And right now, I can tell you that there are mayors and councillors right now who are worried whether or not they're going to be thrown out because that attitude still exists. So a couple of quick uh, pictures about a couple of other projects. Uh, I was invited to develop a small seniors condominium for the Jewish community. We developed plans for a nice four-story building. We went uh, to public hearing and it ended up a three-story building. I was playing golf one day and I saw a reporter from the province. He said, what are you doing? I said, you know, everybody's building for first-time buyers. I'm building for last-time buyers. <laughs> he said, that's a great story. Can we do it? It ruined my golf game the next week. <laughs> anyway, there's the building today. Would it have mattered whether there were three stories or four stories? What I can tell you is there's about 50 empty parking spaces in that building. But I learned a lesson. Don't ask for four stories. Ask for three stories. <laughs> Well, after all, this was a site in Carisdale. George Puel, may, a lovely guy, he thought it was abusive and obscene and did everything he could to make sure it didn't get approved. But I want to show you a picture of this abusive and obscene apartment building. And of course, this is now exactly what we all think we should be building. But the fact is, the opposition to development meant a real shortage of sites. And I am one of those people who believes that part of the problem about housing affordability is directly related to the shortage of suitably zoned development sites. We've heard a lot about condo pre-sales lately, the flipping of them, the tax evasion. I once thought that condo pre-sales were like a high school chain letter. You just wanted to make sure you weren't the last person because you didn't get all those uh, checks in the mail or $5 bills. And I went to Toronto and I heard what they were doing, these high pressure techniques that I felt were forcing up the prices and really weren't fair to consumers. And I wrote about it and did an interview as the new president of the UDI and my friend in Toronto said to me, you keep this up and they'll kill you. And indeed, they didn't kill me, but they did make sure that the editor of the home section was told that I was misinformed and didn't know what I was talking about. But the fact is, I think there's always been problems with the way we undertake pre-sale condominiums. And we don't talk about it a lot, but one of the reasons we have so many one-bedroom and small two-bedroom suites and not the three-bedroom and four-bedroom suites that many need is because if you're trying to pre-sell, you have to blow them out quickly. And that means small, small suites. We've talked a lot about foreign investment. 1974, this chart appeared in Donald Gutstein's book about foreign investment in Vancouver. And uh, you can't read it, but it's pretty much exactly the same story as we hear today. And indeed, in the subsequent years and through the 80s, a lot of stories about were these investors buying up the city. Um, and the fact is, foreign investment became a very significant part of our, of our housing markets. A quick personal story. I was involved in acquiring a site near 4th and Alma to develop a small apartment building. And it was part of a redevelopment of an old uh, Safeway site. 
Um, a Hong Kong buyer came along and wanted to buy the whole building. Um, my partner was Joe Siegel. Joe said, Michael, they're offering you more per square foot than you're telling me you can sell them for individually. We're selling. The only thing was I wa they wanted us to enclose all the balconies. It could be done under the zoning, but it sure made the building look awfully squat and fat. But the other thing was we'd been working with a lot of potential buyers, one of whom I remember well because he said to me one day, how come you guys always make the second bedroom so small? I said, well, it's a guest room, it's a den. No, it's not, he said. That's his bedroom. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to make sure he... So we wrote into the purchase and sale agreement that all of our people would have the first chance to buy. And indeed, we talked a lot about local first policy. This was 1989. And we weren't alone. Li ka uh, son, with Terry Huey, was doing a project called the Regatta on the, north, on the south shore of Falls Creek. And he, too, had been. He went and they sold them all in Hong Kong. And there was, a, again, a front page story about the fact that Canadians were upset that they weren't even getting a chance to buy these units. And it's kind of interesting that Harry Rankin, he basically said, I think we should have a ban on foreign ownership of residential property. As it turned out, we sold the building, and it wasn't until I read the Vancouver Sun that I found out who'd bought the building. I was dealing with a local firm, but it was Jardine Matheson from Noble House who'd come to Vancouver. But on one hand, I was uh, quite upset about the whole thing. On the other hand, I was quite proud. Taxes, the impact of taxes. Most of you don't remember the GST, but it was proposed at 9% and would apply to all residential new construction. The developers in Toronto were so upset about this, they were convinced it was going to destroy any market for new residential. Interestingly, when you looked at housing on the west side of Vancouver, it was going to be significant as well. But the developers in Toronto had an idea. They said, if we can't stop this tax, then let's make sure it applies not just to all new condos and new housing, but all housing, including all resales. I said, that's a ridiculous idea. The goods and services tax is related to creating new housing, new production. They said, I said, no one will go along with that. They said, Blenkarn, he's the head of the commission looking at the GST. He's going to agree with us. Next thing I know, I read in the newspaper, Blenkarn is going to recommend to Michael Wilson that the GST apply not just to new homes, but all resales in perpetuity. Well, the real estate board, everybody went crazy about this. You know, even Jean Swanson was upset because she saw this GST as simply hurting the poor and helping the rich. We felt that it was going to have negative impacts. And uh, one of the concerns was it was going to apply not just to condominium and ownership housing, but rental housing as well. And we realized that we could probably pass off some of those costs to the new uh, buyers, but in the case of a rental building, we couldn't. It was simply going to add, whether it was 9% or 7%, to the cost of new rental buildings. And in the end, I believe that that tax, because it wasn't fully considered, has been one of the reasons why we've not been building as much rental housing in the ensuing 20 years, that, 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 30 years almost, that we should have. Lastly, I just want to look at this perennial topic of how do developers change their public image? I mean, I was a government bureaucrat. I was an architect. I wasn't a real developer. I didn't have one of those fancy Rolex watches. Some of the developers, their pens were worth more than some of the bureaucrats they worked with earned in a year. In fact, I remember one board meeting with UDI where I asked all the developers to remove their watches. They had no idea what I was talking about. I said, it's upsetting for them to hear you asking for tax breaks when your watch is worth more than they earn in the year. 
But Dave Podmer, who's a person I hi highly regard, and I did try to take on this whole topic. Indeed, one year for the UDI Christmas party to try to prove to politicians that we really were ordinary folk. Instead of going to the downtown hotel, I recommended that we have our party at Van Dusen Gardens to see the lights and that all the developers bring along their children and their spouses and that all the politicians be invited to bring along their children and spouses so we could see each other as ordinary people. And was that ever a dumb idea? Because my daughter, <laughs> my daughter beat up the son of a city councillor in Richmond and I never got an approval since. <laughs> the other thing was this whole question of the growing greed movement. And I knew, like, developers, like, they were not very comfortable with the green. And as I was going through these clippings, I thought I would embarrass myself by pointing out I actually did tell this reporter from the Financial Post that not only are developers not green, most of them haven't been camping in more than 20 years. <laughs> Indeed, most of them have probably never been in camping. So let's now wrap this up by looking at what have I learned and what might be some ways to address this situation. And some of these are so very obvious, maybe some are a little less obvious. But uh, le let's start off with this whole question of making wiser use of land. So often I hear people saying we're running out of land. We're not running out of land. We're just not making very good use of the land we already have. And this chart highlights it in Vancouver, but the same applies to most municipalities where between 60 and 70 percent is zoned for single family. Now, today in Vancouver, you can put three homes on a single family lot. Principal dwelling, coach house, basement suite in many instances. But that doesn't apply everywhere. In fact, Vancouver is the only place. So one of the things that I've been pitching, this is from uh, 2013, but this idea of let's look at these forms of what now are being termed missing middle or gentle density, because realistically, we're going to keep large tracts of single family land, but maybe we can do some gentle intensification. And at every opportunity I can, I like to show this little development I did in West Vancouver, because I believe if you can do this in West Vancouver, you should be able to do it anywhere in Canada. This was in Ambleside where we took three single family lots and replaced them with nine units. Three coach houses, three duplexes. From the street it still reads like three large houses. From the lane it's starting to beautify the lane and it's become, I think, now, although 150 people spoke against it or wrote letters, it is now being pointed out in West Van at an OCP public meeting tonight as the kind of model that people would like. That's what happens from time. Here's another opportunity. Throughout Metro, we have these character houses. Some are heritage, some are just interesting character homes. In this case, I was encouraged to buy with a partner a character house, and we got approval to put a suite underneath and two infill cottages on the property. It's a large lot, about 12,000 feet, but again, it was a single family house. And uh, one of these days, my builder is going to finish it. <laughs> and my salesperson wanted me to let you know they will go on sale if you, have, if you know anybody in West Vancouver. One of the problems I think we have is the way we finance growth. I mean, for obvious reasons, we charge the developer as much as we possibly can, especially if they rezone land because they're increasing its value. And it makes sense, why not share that? But one of the downsides of that is that with municipalities, they make developers rezone every site. But the next thing is the magnitude of these amenity contributions and who really pays them. And it's not the developer. I can tell you, the developer passes them on. I pass them on as long as I can. If I don't think I can pass them on, then I simply won't build. But I came across this chart on Twitter yesterday, put out by UDI. 
Now, I don't actually accept all these numbers, but some of these numbers are right. And uh, if anybody's interested, I'll make this available. But the point is that 10 years ago, the municipal fees on a typical unit were $43,000. Now, that to me seems like a lot of money. But today, they're probably anywhere between $150,000 and $350,000, just for the community mandate contribution. And as I note here, that is because it's calculated based on the increased value resulting from the rezoning. In some places, we've said to the municipality, why don't you just fix the amount? And they have. But in Vancouver, down Canby Corridor, the new number is $115 a foot. In other words, we're looking at like $125,000 just for that community amenity contribution. We're looking at $200,000 just for the municipal fees. Then when you buy the land, the land is about $500,000. And the construction's about $500,000. And all of a sudden you realize why developers aren't building affordable housing. Because the municipal fees, the construction costs, the land costs, without any profit, you're still up around $1,300 a foot. Well, that's a huge price. So we need to rethink it. Now, I don't have time to start talking about some of the ways municipalities around the world finance growth, but trust me, they don't all do it the way we do it, where we burden the purchasers of these homes with all of these charges. They, they do local improvement charges, they spread it about over 20 years, and I think we have to start looking at a different thing. The other thing is we've had a lot of conversation lately about speculation tax and school tax, and my dear friend Tom Davidoff constantly going on that our property taxes are much too low and our income taxes uh, aren't being paid, so we should reduce income taxes and increase property taxes, and it's wrong. It's wrong because we have a system of property taxes that are raised to fund municipal services. But what is right is rather than just tinker with this, these two taxes, I think it's time to have an overhaul of the BC assessment system because right now every residential property is the same. And I discovered this at the risk of embarrassing my wife by showing you a picture of two properties we once owned. One on a little island at the end of nowhere and the other in the heart of the downtown. One used a significant amount of public services in terms of roads and sewers and pipes and others. The other was very sustainable, if you like. It had very minimal, had no garbage collection and so forth. But because they were valued at the same amount, they both paid the same taxes. Now, if you think about it, if we want to encourage more and more people to move in more sustainable forms of housing, why don't we reduce the rate for people in multiple housing and increase the rate for single family housing. And since most of you are in multiple housing, I feel safe making that suggestion. <laughs> but just to show you how they do it in other places, in Vietnam I saw all these skinny little buildings. These are all rowed up side by side. Sometimes you saw one skinny building in the middle of a field. And I asked my guide, why is it like this? Oh, they said taxes. I said, what do you mean taxes? Oh, the property taxes in this area are based on the frontage of the building. <laughs> now, if you think about it, there's a logic to it, right? It uses less services. Well, of course, there'll still be children who go to school and so forth. One of the things we talk about is that as more and more families will never afford a single family house, we need to create more apartments. It's interesting that back in 1991, it was a Toronto developer who came to Vancouver, a fellow I knew, and said, you know, you guys are missing out on a real significant market. You should be building apartments and buildings for families with children, with the amenities for families with children. And we've never really done it. We've built townhouse developments, but there's very few apartment buildings that I've seen with indoor play areas for children and so forth. And where you actually don't have to put your two-year-old up on that granite countertop on a silly stool. Now, the city of Vancouver many years ago actually developed some very good guidelines for family housing, and apparently it's reviewing them again. 
And we do every once in a while have stories about children moving into higher density communities. But we need to build the schools, we need to build childcare. But realistically, 20 years from now, the notion of families not living in apartments will seem very odd. They will. Now, one of the problems is building these larger apartments, they're too expensive. When I was at SFU, I got the idea, why couldn't you have a mortgage helper for an apartment just like you have a mortgage helper for a house? And we came up with this idea of designing apartments where the second or the third bedroom might be rented out while a family waits for, for the children to come or whatever. And it became like a mortgage helper in the sky. Vancouver now allows that. So there's another idea. And I'm delighted to say that British Pacific Properties is now proposing these as part of their luxury homes up in the properties. Because when you think about it, it's a very flexible form of housing. Um, some of you know, for 10 years at least, I've been going on about the idea of why don't we set up modular housing on vacant land, on parking lots, privately owned, maybe publicly owned because you could use it as housing for the homeless. And I kept showing this. This is from 2009. And uh, every morning when I wake up and hear about another group opposing modular housing in their neighborhood, I smile. <laughs> but it shouldn't be just for the homeless. I don't think we should be building modular housing on public land because they often say there's nothing more permanent than a temporary facility. But on private land, where we're waiting for the highest and best use, why not build some of these more attractive little buildings? This is a relocatable building because now we can create apartments for millennials and others, not the homeless, people who are just looking for affordable housing. And indeed, once you get outside of the Lower Mainland, you realize that modular housing is very, very popular. And indeed, in Penticton and Valley and Vancouver Island, a lot of modular housing. And uh, I even have bought a mobile home park in Nanaimo because I'm going to try out and put my money where my mouth is on, on that one as well. Je uh, Jessica Barrett wrote a very sad column in The Courier, basically saying, goodbye, Vancouver. I loved it here, but I can't afford to live here anymore. I'm leaving. And sadly, a lot of people have that exact same sentiment. And I understand only too well the cost of building affordable housing without deep subsidies from government is just too difficult. But the irony is that there's so much empty housing already in the region. And while I oppose the empty home tax, I think we should be looking at maybe helping to match people who are looking for housing with people who have empty suites, empty bedrooms, and so forth. <clears throat> and in researching this, I discovered that there are companies now in the States. It's almost like an affordable housing Airbnb, starting to match people. Because I know on my street alone, I calculate that there's probably 75 to 100 empty bedrooms. Now, most people, myself included, isn't going to use my daughter's, fill up my daughter's bedroom with some stranger. But partially because they could never find any public transit. But where we have a lot of homes well located, we should be recognizing the possibility, especially with seniors who want to stay in their home. So there's an idea. We talk a lot about workforce housing. God forbid there's an earthquake. Most of the firefighters and uh, other public safety officers will never get to us because they don't live in many instances where we are, especially if we're in West Vancouver or North Vancouver. They're out in Langley and Chilliwack. And so at SFU, we were having trouble getting faculty and staff because they couldn't afford housing. So we did a development where through a variety of techniques, we brought down the construction costs, we brought down the operating costs, the city, the, the SFU reduced the land, and we made the housing available at 20% below market, with a condition that anybody from the university could buy it, but when they sold, they had to sell for 20% below market then. And we put it in a lease, but you could do this with covenants. My point is, there's a lot of these ideas that we generally don't do. I made this up, this program, but it just seemed like an idea. People said it wouldn't work, but it does work. 
Another idea that I didn't make up, this is the most generic form of housing. And you all know it wouldn't be a lecture from me without preaching about the idea of owning a row house without being part of a strata. It's possible. And now we're starting to see it happen. There's a couple of developments in Surrey. But more and more, when you go to Europe and England, this is the most generic form of housing in the world, and yet we don't do it in Vancouver. Of course, we can't talk about affordable housing without talking about public transportation. Just as the SkyTrain started to open up neighborhoods uh, and is continuing to do so, I think we really need to rethink our investment in public transit. Because to my mind, the sad reality is that people are going to have to move further and further away. But there's no point in doing that <clears throat> Excuse me, if they have to have two cars. <clears throat> I was in London not too long ago. I went into a pub on a Thursday night. The place was hopping. I said to somebody, is it always like this? Well, they said, often, but especially on Thursdays. I said, well, what about on Fridays? They said, people go home on Fridays. I said, what do you mean they go home on Fridays? Oh, they said, they commute. They come in Monday morning. They stay here for a week, sharing a bed sitter with some of their colleagues. And Friday night, they go back to their house because it's located in a place which they can afford. And I wrote a courier column about this. And somebody said, it's already starting to happen here. People are commuting from Nanaimo and other places. So we, they can do it in England because they got a far better public transit system. But we need to do that. So to conclude, we need to learn from what's happening in other places. Some of the best ideas I think I've ever got, I got from Singapore, I get them from the Dutch. The irony is they also, we should do it because they do it, indeed. Um, I don't read Korean, and I'd love to know what I said. <laughs> or what Brian Jackson, remember Brian Jackson said. <clears throat> But the point is the Koreans came to Vancouver looking at what ideas they can learn from us. That slide in the top right is some work I was doing in Russia. And I had to boast and show you that slide on the bottom right. If I hadn't told you that was a Stan of Kazakhstan, I'm sure you wouldn't have known. But I'm actually going there this weekend for a week to judge a competition because they want to learn from North America and from elsewhere around the world what constitutes good, sustainable planning. But finally, just as I hope I've demonstrated a little bit with this talk, we need to learn from the past. And one of the things I'd love to see is more post-occupancy evaluations of controversial projects to see, did all of the concerns that the community had, which were expressed at the public hearing, did they materialize? Let's get some students and independent third parties to do it. So to wrap this up, we do have a severe housing affordability crisis. We've had them in the past. It's never been as bad as it is right now. There's no doubt that foreign investors are impacting our market. I don't deny it. But they've been impacting our market for 30 years. And the fact is, that's not the reason. We need to stop focusing on the foreign investors and start focusing on increasing the supply of housing. These taxes may generate some revenue, but I don't believe they're going to produce the tens of thousands of new rental units that are being promised by some of our politicians. The other thing is, we do need to continue to try and improve our approval system. I found this picture on social media. This happens every morning in front of the planning department, the city of Vancouver. People arrive at 5 and 6 in the morning and put down their briefcase and knapsack and then go and have breakfast. But this is to keep their place in line so that maybe, just maybe, they can get to submit their development or building permit application that day. It's crazy. But that's what's going on in Vancouver. And they're continuing to evaluate things that they have no right or need to evaluate. But the reality is, if we really want to help those in greatest need, we can't do it. The private sector can't do it. The city can't do it. We do need the government subsidies to help those who truly are needy. So hopefully you'll agree 
that there are some lessons that we can learn from the past. And with that, I want to thank you all for coming. I've gone on much too long, but I'll look forward to any comments or questions you might have. There are, I see, microphones here.